This is Dr. John Martin, Chief Medical Officer of Butterfly Network, and I'd like to welcome you to Lessons from the Front Lines, a global perspective. We are joined today by six of the world's finest clinicians who are going to share their perspectives in managing this pandemic. I think what's obvious to all of us is that we're facing something that none of us have ever trained to face before. And there are lessons that need to be learned from these experts so that we can share them across the globe. So we'll start with Dr. Pavetta. Um, thank you for inviting me. Good afternoon. My name is Emanuele Pivetta. I'm from Italy, for the, from the northwestern of Italy, and I work in the high, depend, high dependency unit and in the uh, emergency department of a high, uh, high third level academical hospital here in, uh, in Turin, between Milan and the French border. Yeah, hi there, guys. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Johnny Wilkinson. I'm an intensivist from uh, Northampton in the UK. Um, and I've been pretty much obsessed with uh, Point of Care ultrasound for quite some time now. Started out as a regional anaesthetist and then flowed in from there, more or less. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here today to uh, help out with this webinar and share some insights, hopefully. Nice to meet you all. Next. Hi. How are you? I'm Penny Lima. Thanks for having me as well. I'm the Vice Chair of Faculty Affairs at Columbia University, as well as the Emergency Ultrasound Director and Fellowship Director here call, um, calling in live from New York. Hi, I'm Kasia Hampton. I'm an emergency physician, purebred Polish, trained in Belgium for medical school, then in the US for residency, and now I work in an American military hospital in Germany. Yeah, I know the global perspective, right? Uh, thank you for having me and I'm thrilled to be part of this show tonight. And now from north of the border. Hey guys, I'm Adam Thomas. I'm an eMERGE doc on Vancouver Island and I'm currently in my ICU fellowship here in Vancouver. Hi, I'm Kian McDermott. Delighted to be here joining you from Dublin in Ireland. I'm the director of emergency ultrasound education in the Manor Hospital in Dublin. I think we have Dr. Mike Stone. Mike, you're there as well. I'm here as well. I'm an emergency physician in Portland, Oregon, and a point of care ultrasound guy and a director of education uh, over at Butterfly Network. And thanks everybody for taking time and coming from all over the world to help us out. And, and as all of you who follow the news see that we have physicians now who have faced um, this epidemic at very different stages. So we're going to have some kind of fascinating perspectives from how did you get prepare? How are you preparing? How did you survive the onslaught? And what it looks like maybe from Dr. Pavetta, what it looks like to maybe be on the downside of this. So it'll be very interesting to get these different physicians' perspectives. So here's what we want to cover today in this agenda. The big why, why are we actually doing this and why it's important. It may be painfully obvious to all of us why we're doing this, but I think there's some lessons learned in, in looking at this at the beginning. The second thing we want to talk about are some best practices of triage. I think the biggest challenge for all of us in these hospitals is when you have a massive onslaught of patients at the same time, how do you manage them effectively in this world of isolation? We'll include in that a discussion of a disinfection and how we try to protect ourselves and our devices. Then the third thing, which I find incredible because of all the discussions that we've had with physicians all over the world on how do they manage those patients kind of in the middle. We know those that are incredibly sick come in, they're obvious. Those that are the, the walking well, if you will, they can go home. But what about that group in the middle? How do we manage them and only admit those patients that need to be in the hospital and send the others home safely? And then we're gonna finish up with how to keep you and your family safe. I think this is really, really important discussion um, because one of the most important statistics you'll see later is how we spread this within families. And at the end, Mike is gonna help us sit through some of the questions that you can propose through the Q&A questions on the bottom and see if our, you can leverage the expertise of, of this group we have gathered today or to answer the questions that you wanna know. So let's start with the big why. If you look at the map today on, on the way things are actually starting to unfold um, across the world, it's pretty obvious. If you look at the Johns Hopkins map and you can see there's been a dramatic change just since the last uh, webinar we did uh, about 10 days ago. And if you look to the left and look, there's almost a million confirmed cases around the world. And the physicians that joined us today actually present, represent those countries that are most affected um, by this. So it's incredible how quickly this is spread. And it's obvious all of us are facing the similar kind of problems that we're going to talk about today. 
this is the interesting thing you hear constantly discussed uh, across. How do we flatten the curve? And you see the trajectory here, particularly in the United States. And so we've got to find ways in which the countries that have been successful, how were they successful? And, and how do we learn from them and, and accomplish that ourselves? Because we know protecting our healthcare workers inside this and then therefore protecting their families and their friends is a critical part of pivoting this. So we've got to flatten this curve. It's certainly a lot more than just social distancing, particularly for those on the phone who are basically exposed uh, to this every single day. And we've got to learn from these experts on how actually we can accomplish that. So let's start with best practices. And, and I'll start with, um, with Penny, because this, this actually is coming from New York, the slide on the left of people lining up to get into your hospital. How are you triaging all the patients coming into your hospital? And there are some lessons learned from how you're handling this long line of people? So my, my perspective has changed quite a bit over the last 10 days. Initially, we were using implementing a lot of telemedicine, and I thought that would be a great use of our ultrasound in the tent. To, but I don't think at this point it's great for screening. It's great for management for this borderline hypoxic patients or the patients who are admitted or you're trying to screen for my, myocarditis or any other cardiac manifestations. Um, also, what I've learned over the past 10 days is resource utilization and faculty well, um, safety because you want to decrease the contact time with COVID positive patients. And also we have been running out of sandy wipes. Those are hard to come by. So I'd rather have our faculty wipe down their um, goggles and PPE instead of um, using it as a screening device. So it's, we're quite in the midst of this. Um, resources are tough and sometimes it might be an oxygen tank versus an ultrasound, so. Dr. Pavetta, you, you guard now, probably of all of us in the room have seen the most patients. Uh, this, how are you guys triaging patients in your hospital? And how are you distinguishing between someone who is high risk of having COVID, the respiratory patients, from those that don't have COVID that we're all actually learning may be the ones that are transmitting it to us more than others? Uh, I think that the key is the, uh, the prevalence of disease that you have to face. And uh, we are not ready at the beginning. And the problem was that uh, we are no possibility to uh, sort it out uh, such a solution with the tent and the screening outside the hospital because the, the large number of patients who arrived all together at the end of February and the beginning of March. So the solution for us was to uh, basically divide the emergency department into different pathways. All the patients with the suspect uh, symptoms uh, are evaluated in a specific area for suspect patient, so devote to um, all patients with fever, cough, uh, um, shortness of breath, uh, um, or, uh, or diarrhea. Uh, so we have a, a huge amount of patient in that area and a small one in uh, the so-called clean area for not suspect patient. Uh, and so we start here basically evaluating all of them inside the hospital, right? but in two different pathways. Adam, what are you doing? Are you doing anything different than that? Um, our volumes aren't the same yet. We're lucky because we, uh, we're out west here and the primary index cases we saw back in February were all travel related. Um, so we have enough time to learn from everybody going through the thick of it right now. So basically we learned from you guys to split everything up into a COVID and non-COVID side in the hospitals and triage them that way. Yeah, so we're kind of not at the same phase as Emmanuel yet, nor Penny. Um, we're kind of in the early phase of our surge. So we've divided again on the, on the advice of um, the our Italian um, compatriots, we've divided into COVID versus non-COVID. And within the COVID department, we've done a traffic light system. So COVID green, those walking well, orange that group in the middle and then COVID red patients whereby somebody is is quite quite sick and has a high oxygen requirement so i think you know that's where we're seeing that the biggest area is that COVID orange uh, that undifferentiated patient so 
We are pretty lucky in a sense that we are a military community, so a lot of our patients don't have major comorbidities. But what we did is set up a clinic that's actually pre-screening patients before they even end up coming. So it's right at the entrance of the hospital and the clinic, and a lot of those patients are getting shifted to self-quarantine and being called afterwards uh, with the results of uh, COVID testing. What I've noticed is that in that patient population, a very common thing to say is, oh, I have cough, I have had fever at home, they don't have them in the ED, and then, oh, I've had some shortness of breath, and I was dizzy. And generally, those are very well-appearing patients, which um, I get that they a little, they do a lot of reading on the internet, and the anxiety plays a huge uh, role with some, you know, hyperventilation, those kind of things. Um, but we are, in a sense, lucky that we have patients who don't have those comorbidities. So we do have quite a bit positive patients, but they can be, a lot of them can be managed as outpatient. So is, is the recommendation from the group where possible to, to split up, and you guys jump in and you can certainly ask each other, um, to split up into two different areas and preferably if you can outside the hospital, if possible, uh, into an area where those that are high risk for, for COVID and those that are lower risk. And I think, one other message that I think we have to stress to, to people that are uh, getting prepared is that even though someone may be coming in with right upper quadrant pain that sounds like acute cholecystitis, you have to start treating those people as if they have COVID because there's so much of it in the environment. Is everyone actually going that direction uh, or, or are you still splitting them out into high and low risk? I just, I think one point that you've picked up there, uh, John, in particular is that every single patient who's coming in now where they are COVID until proven otherwise and uh, yes. it's creating huge difficulties for all of us because you may have a barn door patient with pancreatitis for example with an amylase through the roof and all of the classic signs even CT scan evidence of necrosis however uh, they've had a cough and there's a little history there maybe a temperature and all the usual blood markers and uh, inflammatory markers in particular are raised so they're being swabbed and therefore they are being isolated off in the appropriate part of the hospital which is either COVID or non-COVID. So it's creating a lot of difficulties for all of us to use our sensibility heads and have to triage very differently to what we're used to. I think for us, it's mostly in the way we use PPE because as uh, Johnny said, we have to treat everybody as potentially infected until proven otherwise. But if someone comes in with an ankle sprain, I will still wear you know, gloves and, uh, and goggles and a mask um, unless obviously they're febrile and they're coughing as well and whatnot, then I will expand my PPE, but just to preserve it. Um, this is the basic, this is actually to avoid also that COVID anchoring, right? Because that's a huge problem, kind of um, what Johnny said, that we are treating everybody as potentially having COVID, but uh, we might start, and that is already happening, might start happening in other places that um, we would start missing important pathology that's obviously not coronavirus. I can't say it any better than my colleagues. I think the most important thing is what's put out there now is this COVID plus syndrome where we still have to be emerge in ICU doctors like we were before COVID. So we're going to see all those presentations. It's now just confounded that they're either really sick with COVID or they have a co-infection with COVID, which um, does complicate the, the workflow through the hospital. So are you guys swabbing everybody that comes through the door then to make the diagnosis? Only those people that are being admitted for other reasons? How are you managing that if everyone has COVID until proven otherwise? I'd just say, I think it's become very contentious this. Uh, there has been a big drive for swabbing and testing of particularly staff. There are those who are self-isolating in their, in their masses at the moment, particularly in the UK, because uh, once you're swabbed, um, you go off and then you have to stay at home until you are fit and cleared for work. Now, the guidance coming through from multiple specialties, multiple bodies, I think are causing quite a vast amount of confusion amongst all of us uh, as to what the correct thing to do is. And indeed, when the patient is safe enough to be placed in, say, a non-COVID area, I mean, at what point do we just do we declare that that patient is safe and isn't going to infect everybody else in the hospital? It's difficult, really difficult. I think the realization is that while we have divided into a COVID and non-COVID area, 
everybody knows sooner rather than later that that non-COVID area is, is going to become a COVID ED pretty soon. That's where we're at at this point, where we're utilizing the hallways because we're over, over capacity at one of our hospital sites and using negative pressure tents right over the stretchers. So initially that was our intent to divide it to clean and dirty areas, but at this point everything's contaminated. And even the trip and fall elderly patient um, on their CAT scan from the head and neck will have lung findings of COVID without any uh, respiratory symptoms. And we're finding that as well. The, typically the vulnerable patients coming in from an aged care facility, if they're a little bit delirious or just off their feet, are not, they're, they're, they're the people that are turning up maybe a couple of hours later with, uh, with a positive test or, or with positive symptoms. Let me ask you this question. So you've got these people in the emergency room, they come in for other reasons and we send them home. Are we protecting all of them from the other patients that are there and the staff so that they're not going home and becoming, if you will, the, uh, the typhoid Mary into the community? How are you managing to, to actually protect the patients themselves? Is everybody that comes through the door now gets a mask on their face and are, are being treated that way? Pretty much in, in, in our institute, we are, that's what we're doing. Anyone that has any sign of, of, of COVID, we're putting a mask on them. And, and when they're going home, Kasha, when you send them back home, they've, you, you can certainly see the inclination. I've been to the hospital. They didn't tell me I had COVID and they go home. They probably think they're okay. How are you educating them uh, on what precautions they need to take after they've been to the hospital? Pretty much the same precautions that everybody around the world has been giving them to, first of all, if someone has been tested, then they obviously not only the patient, but the entire family is asked to stay home until they are notified of the testing um, results. And obviously, we're just because we are a very big community, very closely related to each other because of the military, they've done a lot of work to try to, you know, pr pr promote uh, working from home, limiting exposures to people. But um, I wouldn't say that we generally tell everybody, oh, you gotta, you know, everybody and their brothers gotta wear uh, a mask unless someone who clearly has respiratory symptoms. How about in Italy, Dr. P? What are you guys doing there? Well, I think that now uh, the probably safest area in our, in our hospital is the COVID area because we use all the PPI and we are definitely some uh, doubt about the, the, the patient in the so-called clean area. So we use a surgical mask for all of them also in the clean area. And uh, in case we perform the, uh, the test for the coronavi coronavirus and we decide for, uh, for discharge a patient ho at home, we, we give all of them all the information uh, for, being in iso for being isolated at home with the mask, with the, um, with the gloves, uh, until we, we have not received from the lab the, the result of the test. So basically, we think uh, all the people as positive uh, uh, before receiving the result of the test. It's a huge work, of course, but now our prevalence of positive is so high that we have no possibility to do it in a different way. So we close this. We'll, we'll, let, let's, say, let's say safely our recommendation from this group is preferably to separate into a COVID high risk and then others. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that everybody's going to be pretty disciplined in the COVID area. The real charge is then for everybody to maintain that level of diligence and discipline in the non-COVID area and treat everyone there as if they have it and try to be safe in that environment. Um, and then obviously the triage areas, if we could have them outside the hospital, that would be preferable. So let's move past this then. If that's kind of the way we triage people that come in, let's move to the next, uh, to the next thing and that is managing the gray zone. I think we can all agree that if someone's profoundly hypoxic, they're coming in the hospital. That's pretty easy. And we also have this group that's pretty easy to send home. Why don't, you, why don't you guys take turns and talk about how you manage those people? Because we have this, we can have, they're not hypoxic at rest. There's some people that do a walking trial. We can talk a bit about that, that get hypoxic. There's some people that use ultrasound scanning of the lungs to triage people. So let's have an open discussion on each of you manage that gray zone patient, because those are the hardest when the hospital's really full. How do we decide who stays and who goes? 
Can I just come in on that one? The, the, um, we've got a very similar system to, to Kian and we call it the traffic light system, which is where the red, the amber and the green come in. Now, the green patient would be clearly the one that's simple to us. They come in, they're complaining of respiratory symptoms. They've walked in, they're fine. They can complete full sentences and the rest. Those guys now, certainly where we are, we can send them home if we're slightly worried about them with a special armband on, and this monitors their temperature, their blood pressure, and their saturation. And we have clinicians who are manning laptops. Um, and if we see any changes that are worrying, spiking fevers, uh, blood pressure dropping, and so forth, we can get onto them immediately, call them in back into the hospital. So that's uh, been an extremely useful innovation that, that we've had. Uh, so that was just my bit about the green zone and I'll let everyone else come in on the complex areas in between so I'll duck out now. I think that patient population is where ultrasound might play an integral role to identify those patients who may have cardiac manifestations um, prior to um, crashing down on the floor. So I think that's a great place to do your six um, mow the lawn on your lo anterior side and posterior part of your chest and then take a look at your heart and look to see if there's any cardiac manifestations of COVID. And Penny touched a very important topic, doing cardiac ultrasound. So in those patients in the gray zone, obviously they, we have to consider a much broader differential diagnosis because someone with a slight fever and a cough and shortness of breath might as well have, for example, a pulmonary embolism that we certainly don't want to miss. Um, so, this is my preference to use ultrasonography, pretty much like a heart-lung IVC type uh, approach to those gray zone patients to make sure that I'm not missing something else and I'm not anchoring on that COVID diagnosis for everybody with shortness of breath, chest pain, pleuritic chest pain and all those things. That's really interesting because um, I think we've all, um, particularly well, well, Kian and I building web pages and all sorts on this, but. Uh, we've all become very, very obsessed with lung ultrasound, and it's been lung ultrasound, lung ultrasound, lung ultrasound till, till you're blue in the face, excuse that pun there. Um, but forgetting cardiac is dangerous, I think. It could be very dangerous because we're picking up all kinds of cardiomyopathies, all, all kinds of things related to the disease, but also, as he pointed out very nicely, if we forget cardiac and the lung-heart interaction going on, I think we could be missing a trick here. I've spent the, Go ahead, Kian. I've spent the day scanning today in our kind of our um, critical care zone. And often before this, when you're teaching a, a workshop, um, lung ultrasound is kind of the, the poor relation. It's, it's either positive or negative, and the findings are um, they're not so exciting. But now things have become much more exciting because it's a pleuropathy more so than anything else. But I think I agree with everybody else. <laughs> It's a case of heart, lung, and IVC. Once you stick to that mantra, you tend not to miss so much. And it's great putting a little bit of science onto the bones of what we've been doing so far and being able to um, show our patients what we're finding as we, as we go along. So I, I get that you guys do a lot of that, but let's, let's assume for argument's sake, you've got a lot of patients in the emergency room. I, I suspect you're not scanning everybody in the gray zone. How many of you are doing walking trials uh, as an assessment tool? Or are you really scanning everybody? It's, it's hard to say, but I think that, uh, yes, we basically scan uh, all patients, uh, most of them, uh, adding uh, the, the walking trial as well for most of them in, in, the gray, in the gray zone, of course. And I completely agree that we need, the, now lung ultrasound is very popular uh, for the type of disease, but we have not to... Um, we have to uh, keep thinking that uh, point of care ultrasound means mean an integration with the clinical data. So we keep using uh, IVC, cardiac, and lung together with uh, all the, the results of the clinical examination, not only the lung for doing a specific diagnosis or for deciding, deciding something in the gray zone. It's not I mean, I think that for us, it's not possible to do something like that. The only way to solve the problem in the gray in the gray zone in such a situation is to integrate all the data that we can from the point of care ultrasound as well. Any, if anybody disagree with that? 
No, not, not at all. And I think the gray zone can sometimes throw up some unexpected surprises. Uh, I was scanning today and an older patient, we have a quite a high older patient population and, you know, wasn't able to tell me about his abdominal pain, but it turns out he has a 6.5 centimeter aneurysm and a full bladder, which was causing him his distress. He had very little lung findings, but he had lots of other findings. So it's, it's uh, aneurysm. Now you're speaking my language here as a vascular surgeon. <laughs> Let's shift the entire conversation to talk about vascular surgery now so we can get something that I'm going to that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I had to become relevant somehow, you guys. Come on. Well, let, me, let me go back to this, though. I want to pin all of you down. How many of you, by a show of hands, how many of you do walking trials on your patients in the emergency room? Wow. Oh, there we go. So what's the score here? Not everybody. It's interesting. I will also tell you that I've gotten feedback from physicians from, I'll pick a couple of other countries that are out there that have said they're doing no ultrasound because they want to use just clinical parameters and they want to protect their staff. They don't want to expose their physicians to that prolonged contact with the patient. How would you argue your point against them? I, I guess from a systems level, to me, I'm really uncomfortable with arguments like that because what, so you're going to still get an x-ray and expose your x-ray to, to that, or you're going to get a CT chest to look up the differential and get everything you want. Um, that doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't make sense because while I'm assessing the patient, getting a feel for their story and looking at them to see how they're doing, I can integrate the data points of a physical exam. And the POCUS exam is just an extension of that physical exam. So yeah, that doesn't make sense. I, I understand walk tests make tons of sense. By the time they've walked into the department and their triage sats are 75, I think that's a walk test for me. But um, yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with saying as physicians, we, we shouldn't be around our patients. We're going to put that responsibility to somebody else. I think that the triage vitals oftentimes because they just walked in or they just rushed into the ED and oftentimes that very first long saturation, even when they just sat down, is pretty indicative of what's going on. So no, I didn't do walking tests, but also on the other hand, let's say I have a 24 year old female who is febrile, tachycardiac, um, somewhat borderline SATs, but she's otherwise very healthy. She has no past medical history, no asthma, no other issues. And, um, you know, I actually, yesterday, I didn't post it yet, but I took a picture of myself inside of a CT, just for the visual comparison. Do you really want to clean that whole area, including the machine and, you know, expose the CT tech, expose the, I mean, put a lot of time into cleaning, expose the cleaning personnel, or can I just cover the probe? Um, even if I run out of the, um, actual cover, uh, you know, I'll just some covers. I tried putting some, you know, like clinch wrap on there. It works just fine. Uh, so being resourceful, right? But um, no, I, I cannot imagine sending someone like this without doing anything additional. That's more objective than me just, okay, vital signs and me just looking how they do when they walk around my department. I think it, it's my, my, again, my, my perspective has changed once we hit um, full capacity at one of our hospitals. And once you're lining up expiration after expiration of bodies in the ER, which you're not used to, a negative pressure tents and intubating and coding somebody every hour, you just want to get your walking, talking patients out of there. And we have to remember that the ultrasound is not an extension of your physical exam because I have patients who are COVID positive with lung findings. However, they can be monitored as an outpatient. And then those patients whose lung findings may be appearing a day or two before they're symptomatic. So it's really still tough. And I think that's a controversial um, thing we have to think about. But um, at this point in New York, we just want everyone who's talking to you to and who appears well to get out of the ER um, because we don't have the resources space and we also don't want them to get ill. Um, and I think doing um, either telemedicine, telemonitoring, as well as just um, some of them have repeat visits. I think that's probably where we're at. Um, and this was not my view maybe 10 days ago. I think Penny Can makes a very about... point um, about the, um, sorry, Cassie, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. No, go ahead. Um, she makes a very interesting point about uh, the fact that, you know, you, your patient who walks in and actually isn't too bad is potentially putting themselves at mega risk of getting 
this virus because let's face it the hospital is a little bit of a hub for this now we're all exposed i'm sure many times a day with viral loads beyond belief and, and so forth um, one thing we noticed um in our place was the ed became like a ghost town when all of this started to hit the press the map was going red the ed was empty and it just made you raise the question what was going on before all of this happened and why were people attending Clearly, you know, World Cups are on, there are bank holidays, the attendances drop, we know this. But this was a huge change in demographics of patient population coming in. It was empty. Now it's not because there are different types of patients coming, but it was a very interesting thing to see. I think what's happened is, and you'll see this phase where it, it empties out and then gets full, and it gets full of different things, and I think it makes it challenging. So I, I think we're not going to resolve this one because it's interesting because I think it depends on the stage at which you see the volume of patients you see will be how you use this, except if you're really good at it. And I think that, uh, or if you believe in it passionately and how it could help. I will say this, and I think this is really important. The data we get and keep these lung images, when the dust clears and it's all said and done, we're gonna have this information and the clinical data, and then we'll have the outcomes of these patients. We're gonna have to spend a good bit of time looking back at it and say, okay, were there findings that we saw in ultrasound that were helpful and predictive? And can we learn from this so the next time this flies around, we've got a pretty good feel of how we've managed this. I think it's hard to find consensus how ultrasound and how triage is done here, um, but I think there's some general principles that are there, and that is you can't just use one clinical parameters alone or the other. There are circumstances where ultrasound clearly helps, and I think the message is it can't be just long. You want to make sure that you're looking at those other symptoms, uh, other systems, and then finally, don't be just COVID focused. People, they coming in there, they can have uh, a lot of things. As like they say, they can have ticks and fleas and that's why they're scratching. So you guys by going to work and gals are actually putting yourselves, your family and whoever else you're around at risk. And I, I couldn't imagine this. And I think of every one of you on the front lines living this kind of world. Why don't you share uh, for the group how you're managing this and maybe what suggestions you have to, to keep some kind of safety and sanity an emotional bond with your family all at the same time. Right, everybody's yeah. laughing already on the images here, and I know what you're waiting for me to say, but <laughs> I'll give an example of what happens to me when I get home from work, if, if you like. And feel <laughs> I, need, I think I want everyone to pause, put their phones and everything on record, because you want to hear this moment. <laughs> so uh, when I get home from work, the routine is as follows. I park the car, beep the horn, and uh, my wife opens the door. Uh, I am then made to doff, as we call it in the UK, donning and doffing, I'm sure we all use those terms. I'm made to take my clothes off at the door, uh, quite literally, and then made to go up for a, for a shower using Dove or whatever product I choose. Uh, however, that's the routine now, and she won't, she won't let me anywhere near her, even for a kiss on the cheek, which I think is very sensible, to be fair. Um, by the point I get in, my little one's in bed, but the other kids, you know, I. I worry uh, a lot about contact with them and so forth, because even though I'm well, maybe not mentally, but you know, physically, um, I do worry that I could be carrying it, could be shedding the virus, I may not have any symptoms. So it's a real worry. I don't know about you guys and what, what you do, maybe not stripping off at the door, but. I think that's one of the most important things, you know, to, to just change and leave all those dirty clothes that you were exposing to um, patients at the hospital. And of course, when you come home, you, you know, take everything off, throw it in a washer and, and, and take a shower. But um, I don't think you need to really practice anything extreme unless you become symptomatic, because uh, otherwise, you know, that becomes like an OCD uh, type situation. But um, but definitely, definitely, please do not wear your hospital scraps, you know, on the way in and out the things that you were wearing in contact with the patients. That's a fantastic point, Kasia. Um, I think what we're seeing now, our practices now, the way we have to be super careful about cleaning and decontamination, dis disinfection in our department with our ultrasound machines, it just highlights the things that we should always be doing or have done in the past, now they're an absolute necessary to carry on if we're going to continue to use focus in the way that we want to use it. So I think it amplifies the good and just reinforces the things that we need to do. So that's a really good point. I think even in New York, we see more people driving uh, because the subways have been so contaminated. So 
in New York City, they are giving out free rental cars for healthcare workers. So a lot of my co coworkers are driving to work and the streets are empty and the hospital, some of the hospitals have provided free parking for us. Um, a few of us actually are expecting on the panel and that creates another layer. Um, I think the evidence still is unclear, even though the CDC recommends um, that there hasn't been that much evidence yet about vertical transmission, we still have, I think pregnancy is still a high risk category in itself. It's a unique category, let's say. So we've done things with our, for our pregnant faculty in our department to either put them in telemedicine or not um, take them out of aerosolizing procedures. Um, you realize, Penny, that there are only two women on the panel, and you said a few of us are expecting, so that's think, not really what she meant. <laughs> Wait a minute now. The guys are expecting as well now. Let's not exclude them from this. How many? I think we have a few gentlemen that are about to be fathers here. Um, I think uh, my scenario has changed in the last week, so before I'd come home kind of like Johnny. I, I, I think my partner isn't so accommodating, though. I didn't get a beer or anything. <laughs> Um, and my neighbors definitely don't want to see me naked. So, um, but I, I would shower in my own bathroom and have my own room. Um, but just given my wife is in her third tri trimester and our two-year-old is a bit of a hellion, um, she's in with her family just to help out with the child supports and, and me not bringing so much virus, hopefully, around them. Manuel, what have you done through this process? Well, for us, it's a little bit the starting point because we are not used to, to wear the scrubs uh, outside the hospital. So we basically change it uh, also before the COVID. And now basically we start using only disposable scrubs. So we change, uh, we change a lot of time uh, during the shift and at the end. So it, it's a good starting point for avoiding to having an, an infection at home. And, uh, and of course, we are keep uh, sanitizing all the staff uh, after every, every single patient. And it, you know, on a personal point of view, I'm pretty lucky because I'm alone at home. And of course, I stop uh, visiting my parents, my nephews and all of them. I have a huge uh, a network of relationship uh, based on Skype or on WhatsApp in order to avoid the uh, personal contact in, the, in this period. Well, we're talking a little bit about disinfecting yourselves, uh, which is lovely, uh, but what about the devices at work? How are you di disinfecting devices? What advice can you give with people? Are you doing anything different or is it whatever's available for you? H how are you handling disinfecting your devices? Well, basically we are disinfecting uh, after each patient all the, all the device. So of course uh, uh, it's easier when you have the, the availability of the handheld devices. We have uh, four of them and uh, it's a, a little bit more long, longer process uh, when we have to, uh, to clean the cart-based ultrasound machine that we have. We have three uh, additional ultrasound machine and usually we need 10 minutes uh, for, for cleaning all of the, all of the, the machine uh, before using it again. So we basically need to uh, start uh, evaluating a patient and in the meantime, someone else is cleaning the, the machine in order to have the possibility to scan all of the patients that we have in the emergency department. I think this has been a defining moment for handheld ultrasound. I mean, I'm a massive fan of, of portables and handheld ultrasound devices, slight obsession. Um, but I think they really come into their own here because they are very easy to clean. Um, there aren't many nooks and crannies. There aren't many knobs and dials where, you know, viruses, bugs and grit and grub can get into. So um, for me, this has been a bit of a, a revolution where they're emerging and coming into their own. And, you know, um, I think you're right. Cleaning the cart based devices can be really tricky, uh, aside from covering the entire thing with relatively expensive surgical style sort of drapes or, you know, the, the, the sticky sort of see-through things, uh, which we don't have many of, I've got to be honest. Um, I think you're, you run into trouble and it potentially delays things, getting scans in between patients. 
Just some ideas, because you mentioned, you know, expensive surgical drapes, but is it really necessary? Simple painters foil would do probably if you have to use a big device if you don't have another one. So this is a moment when we have to turn on the pandemic thinking that low resource and that resourcefulness in ourselves, not just use hospital grade stuff, which is generally very expensive. We really have to start um, utilizing things that are cheap and available on the market. And uh, in countries that are not as well off, people are going buying equipment in hardware stores um, just instead of PPE because it's cheaper and because it's available. And again, for covering um, here, an idea for covering, you know, small handheld devices, the, the, the plastic food wrap can work uh, for uh, for covering um, big tower-based devices. Just get um, just remove everything that you don't need going into the room. If you just pretty much all you all you need is the cardiac probe because you're gonna do heart lung IBC and for the findings you want you're gonna see on it what you need, and then um, and then you know cover it with a piece of plastic sheet. And, and that's, you know, that would be my recommendation. You just have to get resourceful and find cheap resources available. And I, I think, think yeah. Build your ventilators and all sorts now. So, I mean, the world's your oyster, really. And getting rid of the ultrasound gel bottles, I think was really important and try to use the individually packed surgery loops. Yeah, we just did that in the last 10 days and it, it seemed like the most sensible thing to do. And then I find out most of the rest of the world has been doing that. The, the gel bottles are fomite. Um, so we've started to deploy some of our handheld units into our respiratory wards. Um, um, and we're starting to use them for evaluation, serial evaluation um, with myself and some of my respiratory physician colleagues. So it's that proving really useful. We're gonna do a, a proper rollout as of next week. Well, I don't want that point to slip by about using Surgilube, but because that's an important one. We always think with ultrasound using gel, but uh, this is another little good pearl that people should take away from this and getting prepared because that's that's a great little trick. And just for logistics, I think that that. Oh, sorry, sorry, Cassie. No, no, no go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say for logistics and PPE, like we've already alluded to, cohorting is so important for a lot of these issues that if you have a cohorted unit. You do not need to throw your phone and your handheld unit in a big plastic sheath for every scan. You just leave it in that cohorted unit, and that's what we're doing in our hot zones. Yeah, or that's we what have we're doing too. Yeah. yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. Hot zone machine and less is more. So strip back everything, use less. That means a, a handheld as opposed to a cart based system. So be it. I just wanted to add that for the for the rest of the non English speaking world listening to us tonight, what surgery loop is is that little pocket of gel you use for rectal exams more often. So Thank just you, so you guys know. Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, I, I, we've been using OptiLube. That's the small sachets you put in patients' eyes. <laughs> well, whatever works. <laughs> Johnny, I think you're on the wrong end if that's what you're doing, my friend. I, know. <laughs> I think it's this is the moment where the HR department steps in and I'm going to be wise to say, let, let's conclude this whole thing with saying, obviously, disinfection, get creative, use alternative um, options out there, which I think is very smart. Um, and I think it in, leave inside the room a device. I think that's a really key point here. It makes a ton of sense for everyone. Well, I want to pause here for a moment and let's see if Mike Stone's got some questions for this group before we come to an end, because we want to give people the opportunity to, to get some, some advice from you for questions. Mike, can I turn it over to you to start asking some questions? Sure thing, John. Um, so like ex amazing discussion as anticipated, um, a ton of questions that have come in and I can't possibly ask all of them. So I'm going to just pick a couple and we'll get started. Um, Interestingly, um, you know, anybody who's done lung sonography knows that there's only about, uh, I think currently 470 different protocols for lung ultrasound. I may have missed one or two. Um, question coming in of uh, recommended technique. Is it six zones? Is it four zones? Is it 20 something zones? I'd be interested to hear um, what people are doing in terms of uh, uh, an exam that maybe balances uh, accuracy and, and good clinical results with time spent doing a study. 
Um, being a very simple Brit, I like to stick to the six zone approach, which is uh, four on the upper zones, if you like, and then the lung bases or plaps points, as we call it. I think if you're picking major pathology on those uh, points, you can then start scooting in between. But for me, doing 28 point lung scanning on all of these COVID patients is too time consuming and I don't think yields many results that the six zone doesn't. And, and, and similar, Johnny, I put the probe where I would have put my stethoscope um, a number of years ago and I've been using that 12 zone approach, so six on either side, it just seems to make sense. But knowing that if I need to drop some zones, I might drop an anterior zone and focus more on postural basal zones because that's where the, the virus ends up. Sorry, Keen, a, a what? A stethoscope? He means wheeze detector. He, means oh, he, wheeze he detector. added a few years ago. He corrected <laughs> himself. I think, we, I think we call that medical bling, a stethoscope. Um, Emmanuel, what are, what are you guys doing in your hospital for, uh, for a, a lung approach? I'd expect you're probably standardized with your group in terms of what kind of scanning you're doing. Well, usually we start with the uh, uh, four zone for each thorax, basically we, before the COVID, and now we are standardized more or less in using a 12 zone approach, six for each thorax. Also, with, of course, the general idea is that uh, uh, if, I, if we have some specific DAP, we try to sweeping all around a specific area, but six zone for each hemitorax is enough for having a general idea about the, about the lung, I think. And it, it's quite uh, uh, fast to do as well. Can I ask, are people scanning across uh, ribs or are they scanning between ribs? Maybe I'm a, just a barbarian, but I just code everything. If you're going to scan a bunch of different organs and I just lawnmower back and forth um, just to try to get a survey. Uh, so across ribs for sure and uh, both up, down, left, right. Um, but probably just because I can't stay focused. I think people who have a, a lot of experience with lung ultrasound can uh, like to do a, a sort of intercostal view where you're essentially somewhat transverse to the body and getting that broad swath of pleura to look at without the anchoring of the ribs in the screen. I think generally my experience has been people who are more novice or, or um, generally newer to lung ultrasound, having the landmarks of the ribs is useful um, so that they don't end up transversely scanning a rib as opposed to transversely scanning the pleura. Yeah. I screen sagittally doing the lawnmower, but if there's any pathology, I, I turn transverse. Yeah, I just find you exactly get an extra inch, you get an extra inch view of that pleura when you turn transverse, once you miss the, uh, once you miss the, the, uh, the ribs. Johnny, you're laughing. No, it's just, I, I, I just think Penny and I shouldn't be on the same webinar because we're both laughing exactly the same you guys thing. You got to stop. Okay, Mike, next question, please. <laughs> next question. Next question. Um, I don't know if you can get a rating on webinars in terms of like mature, but we're, we're going to get there pretty soon. Um, we'll move away a little bit to a, what I think is a, a pretty interesting question. Um, we know that uh, that um, disseminated intravascular coagulation and uh, DIC and uh, um, coagulation markers are often elevated in these patients, and that um, you know we're definitely seeing an increase in peripheral pulmonary emboli in COVID patients, uh, if not also more central or, or lobar pulmonary emboli. Um, so interested to see what the panel thinks about screening for pulmonary embolism in COVID patients. You know, if we were to back up, um, you know, three, four months ago and someone came in tachycardic with an oxygen saturation of 70, um, certainly would be on everyone's radar in a bigger way than it is currently. So are there triggers that make you kind of go down that route? Everybody's presumably gonna have an elevated D-dimer. Um, and not sure that using that for, for pretest probability is going to help that much. So we'd be curious what people are doing. I think this is really tough because basically, for example, today um, I've scanned, I don't know, 10 patients. Um, I'd say three to four of those, you could textbook label them as having a PE on what you see on a sonography. Um, but I know probably the most likely explanation is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction relating to the the virus uh, load on the lung uh, and so this is a really tough one because we know these guys unfortunately uh, uh, the thromboembolism is very high on the list of, of, of a cause of mortality so I think this is one of the most difficult areas to make a judgment on from 
your sonography, do you then give them treatment dose uh, heparin? Uh, you know, it, it's a tough call. Yeah, we've been struggling a lot because um, we really don't want to move the patients out of our cohort of units to send them down for a scan and chew up scanning for the rest of the hospital too. Uh, and I, I, I don't think there's great evidence outside of retrospective evidence around increasing um, D-dimer levels, needing heparin and increasing mortality. But I think we all agree based on some thromboelastograms coming out of these patients, they're hypercoagulable. Um, but which one specifically anticoagulate, we don't know. We're just increasing our prophylaxis dose. And when the D-dimer gets scarily high, we just empirically put them on heparin. I don't know if that's the right call, but um, just to balance resources and clinical use, that's what we're doing. Sensible. So I, I love this question. Uh, this is coming from Walton Sumner. Um, and uh, you know, imagine a setting with very limited specific SARS-CoV-2 testing of capability funny that that's the framing because I can definitely imagine that setting. It's my setting, um, although it's also much of the world at the moment. Um, how well do you think POCUS performs as a screening test in asymptomatic patients? And do you think you'd potentially identify a large proportion of asymptomatic patients who are spreading disease? Would a normal POCUS uh, be enough to sort of really uh, drop down the probability of, of COVID-19? And would an, ab would an abnormal POCUS have a role in, in contact tracing? Ooh. We've had um, a slight revelation has occurred, actually. We've been uh, teaching lung ultrasound to people. Um, many medical students, as the models, as we're teaching them, they'll swap over and become the model, and then they're the uh, they're being trained. We have discovered that, I'm sure many people have, um, we've picked up some lung ultrasound changes in these guys. They're feeling well. 48 hours later, they go down with a cough and a fever, and we've picked up 48 hours prior, uh, these guys have got COVID. So this has been interesting. Of course, N equals not many, um, but we're going to try and follow this up with a, with a small study, actually, um, coming up because we, we think we may be seeing things earlier in these guys, even when they're asymptomatic, they've got lung ultrasound changes. So that's interesting. Do you have another anyone, mic? Yeah, anyone else having experience, just curious if you're seeing patients COVID positive with completely clean lungs, have you, have you come across a confirmed COVID positive patient with, with just absolute normal A-line pattern no findings. And I'm already interested because I'm seeing some people nodding that they have and some people shaking their heads that they haven't. So really, I'd, I'd be interested in, in the panel's uh, feelings on that. I have a small cohort of quarantined faculty. Um, I was doing remote monitoring on them and it did not correlate with their symptoms all the time. And the days that they were symptomatic, sometimes they had some findings, sometimes they didn't. And so it was really tough. And it would actually, the thing with this virus is it waxes and wanes and you could feel fine one day and the next day you're feeling horrible and hypoxic. And Penny, I think we've seen that with some of the, the posts on social media, you can have quite nasty looking lungs and inflamed lumpy bumpy lungs and plural lines, but be quite normal high, high oxygen levels. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's, it's a difficult one to pick out, isn't it? Very fascinating. I think, it would be oh, I think it would be interesting to see the pediatric population because they often have very different symptoms, also with a lot of GI type uh, complaints. And I've had um, a scan one kid who was, I was suspecting could be covered positive fever GI complaints, um, but the lungs, I just looked at it, there was nothing there. Um, so I think uh, a lot of that information would come from the PD patients, in fact. There's been some great evidence, um, oh, sorry, growing evidence. Uh, I think the fascinating thing about SARS-CoV-2 versus CoV-1 is its binding affinity for angiotensin II receptor and the location of that receptor throughout the body. It's not just in the upper and lower respiratory tract, but it's in the GI tract. There's pathology uh, samples now. It's coming out of kidneys, those kind of things. So super interesting. Had a couple of, uh, of questions come through on whether any of the folks on the panel have seen patients with cardiac complications from COVID-19 in the absence or preceding 
lung complications. So we, we know that we, there's a fair amount of cardiac complication in these patients. And Adam, we spoke a little bit yesterday about the value of image storage and um, downstream ability to compare the initial cardiac ultrasound to the, what, the, what the patient's cardiac ultrasound is looking like day two or even 12 hours later in the ICU. But the question's particularly about, um, are you seeing patients present with cardiac complications who aren't yet or, or not at all uh, experiencing pneumonia or pulmonary changes? That's an interesting one because I think the, um, the, the lungs being such a hub of the ACE receptor and the way the virus gets in, uh, I think the hub of the party and the activity this virus sits in there. So my thoughts on this and reading the Italian data and stuff that came out of, uh, of Wuhan in particular, they, they tend to, you tend to see the septic cardiomyopathic picture developing after the lung. Uh, symptoms and indeed the sonographic changes are developing the, in the lungs and it kind of makes a bit of sense the interaction between the two so I, I don't know the answer to that and personally I've not seen any uh, standalone septic cardiomyopathies uh, with no lung changes. I'd like to know really, Emmanuel's answer to this one. Just yeah I'd like to love to see him Penny, right? yeah. there. Well I have to say that I am um, I think uh, almost no experience in see uh, some cardiomyopathy as first uh, uh, manifestation of COVID. Um, it's definitely part of our basic approach to get a view also of the art in the emergency department, basically for all the patients that you have to admit, because in this way we have a starting point for the following monitoring during the, during the admission. So I think, uh, this, I mean, our experience is not to see a lot of uh, um, cardi uh, cardiomyopathy at the beginning, so at the first presentation, but most of them uh, are developing the admission. So also in this case, cardiac ultrasound is a good starting point for the next evaluation for the patient. I think this, this issue is a bit confounded too. Everyone's saying is it the virus themselves, but I think there is a, a subset of patients that were doing it too that um, this phenotype that the multiple phenotypes were describing, that, that hyper-compliant lung where you crank the PEEP to 15 based on an ARDSnet uh, ladder, and that all that pressure is actually transmitted to the right ventricle, who's already got a lot of afterload from hypoxemia. I think we're causing some of this harm with the respiratory support we're applying. So that's really important to consider as well, where baseline ultrasound evaluation and serial examination can help as well. Yeah, I think the interesting stuff was coming through is we were all obsessed with slamming the peep up on these guys. Uh, it was everywhere, this, particularly in the ICU world, and I guess, Adam, you know this blatantly, but actually they do not respond well to peep, some of these guys. They, they, it is horrendous. So we're cranking it down, allowing tidal volumes to drift up a wee bit, and we're putting the frequency of ventilation up in this, but peep can be a nightmare. Are any of the panelists using a standardized lung score um, when they're assessing these patients and are, which I'm shaking my head to because I'm not. Um, and uh, the other part of that question is, are there, are there any findings that really kind of put you towards, um, you know, either, either really raise your suspicion or lower it that you're going to have a uh, patient decompensate shortly or in the near term? In terms of lung scores, I've seen it some of the, the research papers that are coming, especially out of Italy, Emmanuel, you might be able to comment on that, but um, in terms of scoring the severity of the pleural involvement and sub, sub, subpleural consolidations and then bronchograms being involved as well. Um, I'm not using it personally. Um, I'm not sure about the rest of the panelists. No, I'm not. I've got to be honest. I, I think it's a time constraint thing. And also I'm not entirely sure it adds much to uh, what we're looking for. I'm using it in the main to titrate diuretic therapy, decisions on PEEP, um, decisions on proning, things like that. I want to close with an interesting question, and it really just came to me during this. And, and you can choose to answer it in either English or your native language. Um, and I'll apologize for not warning any of you that this is the question. But wh here's what I want to ask. I want to know how this has affected you. How has being involved in this whole process affected you as a physician? Has it changed your perspective about anything, about the profession that you chose, about the colleagues, about the response of your hospital? I, I would like each one of you to just walk through and say, give us your impressions of how this has impact, impacted you personally 
being involved with this on the front line? Um, actually, it's not a surprise question because I already mentioned what it meant to me. I've had the privilege and the honor to volunteer some time training special operations medic on point of care ultrasonography. And with all this, I realized that um, working with them and constantly thinking about this wartime medicine and low resource environment has actually prepared me quite well to switch into the idea of pandemic, pandemic thinking and low resources and managing the stress, fear, um, playing against an enemy that does not play by the rules and trying not to become the next victim. So with that, I would like to thank all the amazing people out there on the military front lines who has taught me a lot and prepared me for this. I think for me, the amazing thing about all of this is that pan you can never be prepared for a pandemic, but what it has highlighted certainly in the, the National Health Service here in the UK, is that um, the appreciation that we have uh, been given from our hospital, from colleagues, from friends, and from the community is quite phenomenal. And we really appreciate it because we are trying to keep everyone safe as we can. Um, the other thing is that resources we previously could not get hold of, we can now get hold of without any bureaucratic barrier. So I think this has been a bit of a revolution for us and also a great revolution for ultrasound too. I'm exactly the same, Johnny. I, I think we've seen Ireland is in, in a lockdown state at the moment. And um, I, see, I think you see a country pulling together, a hospital system, system pulling together in ways that we never thought was possible and people coming up with innovative solutions, um, creative thinking, and it, exactly it's, it's, it's a, a new dawn for, for point of care ultrasound. Penny? For, for us, it's still a very emotional question um, because we have a lot of friends, family, and even our faculty affected. So when you're intubating another attending from another service, it really hits you hard. And not all, only are your faculty COVID positive, but you hear about them losing their loved ones that night as well. So it's still really raw right now here in New York and seeing the numbers still escalate. Um, however, you know, you make lemonade out of those lemons and I've never seen a hospital um, and a whole state come together so cohesively and the camaraderie has been enormous, people pitching in and the internet and webinars have made the whole world a smaller place and people collaborating and the dissemination of information and best practices has been really impactful. So thank you for having me. Well, I think that our situation looks like the same in New York. So it's very emotional. It looks like to be in the middle of the storm. So stop having any type of plan and just thinking day by day. But it looks like it's strange because here in Italy, a lot of people is singing uh, from the balcony to say that before or late, uh, all this crazy period will stop. So it looks like to be uh, in a very long uh, final day for the uh, football championship. That really looks like here in Italy, so a lot of flags uh, all around the balcony. And it's just a way to thinking all together that you could arrive at the end of the storm or something like that. We hope so at least. I, I just reaffirm everything the panelists have said. They're some amazing people. I think for me personally, um, it puts a lot of things in perspective. And I think everyone around the globe sees that, that um, when you have a pandemic that affects people living or dying, that's a big question than us focusing all on, on publishing and exporting and growing the economies. Um, I think it puts the whole globe into perspective what's important. So um, it's, it's amazing to see everyone rise to the occasion from everyone staying home, everyone cheering us around the globe, those kind of things. I've, I've just been amazed at the response of the community in general. I mean, I don't think, you know, there's always some risk with going into, uh, into healthcare uh, with disease transmission. And I don't think any of us really thought we were signing up for this kind of risk. Um, but the rallying among the healthcare community has been incredible. The rallying from people ship random friends of friends shipping uh, personal protective equipment through their random connections. And it's really, it's kind of amazing how well everyone's kind of uh, come together in, in a situation that demands it. So I don't have much to, much to add to what has already been said that's, that's been pretty outstanding. 
Yeah, I, and I really appreciate uh, actually the sentiment you all think, and I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, through the storm comes a rainbow, and that rainbow is that a greater appreciation we have of one another. And, and um, I, I can honestly say I'm so humbled by my profession and how it's rallied and how it is so bravely taken on this that it's, uh, I'm very proud of my colleagues and everyone working in the hospital systems, and I'm proud of the countries getting behind them. Well, this has been fantastic. It's phenomenal. I think we've learned, you know, obviously it's spreading everywhere. Uh, there are different approaches that can be taken. Triage, I think the key messages are separate, you know, the COVID high and the not, but in the not, make sure they, you think that they have COVID until proven otherwise. Uh, I think we've learned different techniques of how to use ultrasound, different lubricants, different color covers. I think there's a lot of different ways. Maybe a key take home message there is leave a device in the room. That's a great one. The gray zone, I think, has left us with some variability. I'm not sure we have consensus there, but I think we'll learn more. And I think the importance is going to be when it's all over, analyze this. But there's clearly a role for ultrasound to play. And maybe, maybe not so much in deciding who comes in, but setting the stage for knowing what's happening to people once they do come in, what was that starting point? And then at the end is keep your family safe. Uh, you can make it entertaining, uh, like our friend does in, and does in England for your family. Uh, we should all hope we got someone so nice as to hand us a beer when we get home. That's quite, quite a nice joy. And I guess my recommendation and my hope for all of you is that you stay safe through all of this. We're, we're eternally grateful for the wisdom that you've shared with everyone. And we look forward to following you to the end of this and maybe sharing a webinar in the future when it's all over again. What were those top lessons learned that we can share with everybody else? So thank you for joining us here at Butterfly. We continue to be dedicated as an entire team to just be a portal of education and information. We look forward to you sending information to us through the website, asking any questions of us that you might have. We will do our best to reach across the world and get your answers. So good night, everyone, and be safe.